Special thanks to Schumann 3D Blast, Shine Wolf, Ministry of On Wii Control, Metric Conversion, Velsheran, Thingy, Lemon314 and Lord Entropy for their generous sponsorship of my videos. Visit David X Newton on Patreon for the backer chat and extra content. This time I'd like to talk about an element of OpenTTD which you might not have even realised was there, but which I find a very interesting piece of mathematics that makes the game look a lot more natural than it otherwise might. You might have noticed that when you clear a large area of the map, or the AI performs one of its insane earthquakes when trying to remodel a landscape, the ground will be barren for a while before grass slowly grows back onto the affected tiles with a random natural sort of pattern to it. This growth is one part of the run tile loop function in landscape.cpp. The same routine is used to make trees grow gradually, or to make town buildings get a step closer to being constructed, or to loop the appearance of a crop tile on a farm through its various states. The game is timed so that tiles will be updated every 256 ticks, or about every 7.5 seconds. The simplest way for the game to time the updating of the tiles would be to wait those full 256 ticks and then to loop through all of them and update them together, and I'm now showing a version of the game modified to do exactly that. There are a couple of problems with this approach. The first is just that it doesn't look very good as it loses the natural seeming random pattern of growth. The second, more practically, is that you're packing a ton of activity into one tick. Even a standard 256 by 256 tile map will need 65,000 tile updates all at once, and once you start asking the game to do a ton of work in one place, you're going to see irritating periodic pauses that make your buses break down far less efficiently as the game struggles to keep up. To avoid asking the computer to do so much at once, the game divides its tile updating activity into 256 batches, so that it only has to do one 256 of the work per tick. On a 64x64 64 64 map consisting of 4096 tiles, this means the game will run batches of 16 tile updates per tick, rotating between them so that each individual tile is updated every 256 ticks, but there's a spread on exactly when each tile gets its turn. To decide the order in which tiles are updated, it could just go through them in numerical order. No matter what the map size is, they're numbered in rows starting from the topmost tile towards the left. You can see the effects of that approach here, with the update making a sweeping effect from the top left to bottom right. This is more efficient and better looking than the all at once approach, but it still doesn't look very natural and it leaves big portions of the map looking lifeless between updates. To make the pattern look organic and spread the activity out across the map, OpenTDD uses a clever piece of mathematics that generates a random looking list of all the tiles in the map on the fly, with a guarantee that one tile will never be chosen twice before all the tiles have been covered. This is the code in Run Tile Loop that's responsible for creating the list of tiles to update. As you can see, when this is first called, it looks up the tile number to work on from a variable called cur tile loop tile, which starts with the number 1, and performs an update on the tile with that number by calling tile type prox on it. Then it looks at the tile number it just updated here, and performs something to it once, then does whatever this thing does, and some other magic goes on with this random seeming 0x number here, and then it loops back to update the tile that comes out of that, and eventually a miracle happens, and the current tile presumably returns to the value 1, at which point the algorithm can start on the loop again. To explain what's really happening here, how you can somehow run a loop repeatedly and get a perfect cycle of random seeming numbers out of it, I'll need to dive into some concepts all the way down at the binary level, and build up again from there. At the most basic level, every piece of data a computer touches is based on ones and zeros, as an electronic signal is recognised as either on or off. This is a binary digit, or bit. It can be on, represented by 1, or it can be off, represented by 0. Being able to store just a 1 or a 0 isn't very useful most of the time, so more complex data is represented using combinations of these bits. They work just like our decimal numbers do, where digits to the left represent the number of tens and hundreds and thousands. In this binary system, each digit to the left represents the number of 2s, 4s, 8s and so on. So a binary value of 1 is the same as decimal 1, 1 0 is a 2 and no 1s, which is 2, 1 1 is a 2 and a 1, which is 3, and so on. 8 bits represents 1 byte, and together these 8 bits can hold 256 possible combinations, which can be notated as a number from 0 to 255. 
For now, we'll pretend that our map only has 16 tiles on each side, so these 256 possible combinations are enough to separately identify every tile on our map. Having got that concept, we now need to talk about how a computer can chop up and manipulate the bits in this byte. In addition to being able to add binary numbers together and do all the other operations we're familiar with, there's a whole new set of things that can be performed on binary called bitwise operations, which we don't really have an equivalent for in decimal. These allow us to take pieces of the whole binary number and do some trickery with them, and the algorithm that OpenTTT uses to generate the cyclical list makes quite heavy use of these. One such operation we're going to encounter in the algorithm is called bitwise AND, represented here by the ampersand sign between the two numbers. A bitwise AND will look at each binary digit in the two numbers it's operating on, and produce a binary number that has ones in only the places where the input numbers were both one. This can be awkward grammatically, because in English we tend to use the word AND as a synonym for PLUS, where for example 1 and 2 is 3. But if we bitwise AND 1 and 2 together, you can see there are no places where the binary representation of both numbers contain a 1. Therefore, while 1 plus 2 is 3, 1 bitwise AND 2 is somewhat confusingly 0. Along the same lines, the numbers 6 and 3 are represented in binary as 110 and 011, so 6 bitwise AND 3 only leaves the middle one digit intact, giving 2 as the result. A similar operation that we'll also be using is called XOR for exclusive OR. This works in much the same way as AND, but it will only produce a one digit in a place if the pair of bits in the inputs are different from each other. Two ones or two zeros will result in a zero. Using our same example numbers from earlier, 1XOR2 becomes 3 because both the pairs of bits are different in the inputs, and 6XOR3 becomes 5, dropping the middle one digit because both of them are on in the inputs. It's possible, and indeed I find it easier, to visualise this as a 1 in the second operator being a signal to toggle whatever's in the same place in the first operator. 12, which is 1100, x ordered with 6, which is 110, will make the two middle digits toggle, giving 1010, which is the decimal number 10. The whole sequence of bits can also be moved along the number in either direction in two operations called bit shift left and bit shift right. These will probably feel more familiar as they're almost equivalent to dividing and multiplying a number by 10 in decimal. In this case, we're multiplying and dividing a number by 2. If we shift the bits of the number 6 right, then the digits representing the 4 and the 2 become a 2 and a 1, making it 3. The leftmost bit gets filled in with 0. If we do it again, one of the numbers falls off the right-hand side, and the result is 1. This is the same result as dividing the 3 we had by 2 and ignoring the remainder. Bit shifting the binary number 6 left will make the 4 and the 2 become an 8 and a 4, giving us 12, doubling the number. At this point, you might be wondering if I'm ever going to get back to Transport Tycoon again, but we've got one more thing to explain first. You're going to have to trust me here, but if you'll let me, let's talk about linear feedback shift registers. An LFSR, as it is more sanely known, is a sequence of storage elements which can pass their data down a line, just like we did when we used the bit shift write operator. To generate our sequence of numbers that cover all the tiles in our 16 by 16 map, we're going to store our tile number as 8 bits, or 1 byte, and it will start by containing the number 1, like we saw in the OpenTDD code. We'll then use this byte as a linear feedback shift register by performing a loop that involves repeatedly bit shifting the numbers to the right, and we'll keep track of the tile numbers that we've visited on the map below. To start a step, we bit shift all the digits to the right once, and the effect of this is to just drop the solitary one off the end and leave nothing. But this isn't our next tile number yet. The linear feedback part of the LFSR's name means that instead of just filling the leftmost bit with zero, we're also going to use information we got from the register itself to form the next number. Our rule is going to be, whenever the digit we picked off the number is a 1, like it is now, we're going to toggle the values of certain positions in the shifted number to get our new tile number. Registers that work in this kind of pattern are specifically called modular or Galois LFSRs after the French mathematician. On a code level, we can change the digits in the byte by performing an exclusive OR with a fixed value that we're going to call our feedback. Remember that one of the ways to think about an XOR is to toggle the digits of the first number whenever there's a one digit in the second one. 
For a small example to begin with, we'll use the decimal number 5, or binary 101, as our feedback value. When we XOR our byte with this, it will toggle the first and third bits counting from the right. The word for a bit that gets altered to generate the next number like this is a tap. So on this step, we started with the number 1, we shifted it off the end to give us nothing in the register, then because we pulled out a 1, we toggle the bits on our taps. This results in 101, which is decimal 5. This completes a cycle of our LFSR, and so this is the next tile that we visit. We repeat the same process, shifting right and then toggling, to get 111 or 7, and the next result is 110 for tile 6. On the next step we pull a 0 off the end, so this time we don't perform any toggling, and this leaves us with just 11 for 3. Continuing to follow the same rules, the cycle finishes off with binary numbers 100 for 4, 10 for 2, and then returns to 1 where it's ready to start again. You can see now that using these two taps has, by a miracle of binary mathematics, given us a sequence that rotates through the numbers from 1 to 7 in an unpredictable seeming pattern. The exact sequence can change dramatically depending on where you place your taps. Using 110 as our feedback value gives this different sequence of the same numbers. Using these ones instead gives a much longer cycle with numbers that are more scattered over the grid. What we need now is a value to use as our feedback that will cause our tile number to cycle through every possible combination of ones and zeros before returning to the beginning. One such value is decimal 195, which is written in binary as 11000011, and so creates this arrangement of taps. LFSRs that cover every possible combination like this are called maximal length linear feedback shift registers. Fortunately, I didn't have to derive this feedback number myself, because people much better at mathematics than I am have already worked these out, and databases of them are available online. The OpenTDD code mentions that it got the ones it uses from a list by Professor Phil Koopman at Carnegie Mellon University. For an 8-bit sequence, there are a surprisingly common 16 feedback values like this that will form a pattern that covers all the combinations it's possible to reach. You may have noticed by now that even with an ideal input, LFSRs do have one blind spot. They can never reach zero, because the output of an LFSR with all zeros in it will always just be zero. OpenTDD works around this by just forcing an update to tile zero, in addition to whatever the LFSR told it to update, on every 256th game tick. Speaking of OpenTDD, let's exit this lesson and finally revisit the game that I'm allegedly making a video about now. Now that we know how LFSRs work, we can make a lot more sense of what the game code is doing in Run Tile Loop. First, it selects its feedback value depending on the size of the map. The numbers here are written in hexadecimal, which is a more convenient way of representing binary numbers instead of writing out a whole load of zeros and ones. Each character represents a group of 4 bits with a number that goes from 0 to F instead of a decimal 0 to 9, and each digit denotes a number from 0 to 15. To make it clear that a number is in hexadecimal and not accidentally read as decimal, hexadecimal numbers tend to be prefixed with 0x. The feedback value that OpenTDD happens to use for the 64x64 64 map size is hexadecimal D8F, which in binary is 11010001111. This feedback number is 12 bits long, which is the size necessary to make room for 4096 combinations, which is the number of tiles in a map of this size. The code then decides how many tiles it should update during this tick, by taking logarithms of the map's x and y dimensions and performing some bit shifting, which will have the same result as counting the total number of tiles on the map and dividing by 256. In this case, we'll be updating 16 tiles per tick. Then, if the current tick number happens to be divisible by 256, it will perform the special case update of tile 0. After that, it will take the first tile number to work on from the Kerr tile loop tile, and start performing the LFSR loop that we just learned about. Within the loop, this line calls whatever function is appropriate to update the tile, given whether it's a water tile or grass or a house or whatever it is, then this is the line that makes the LFSR generate our next number. This code is doing what we just described, but it's written in a way that looks pretty unnatural and confusing to human eyes, so I'm going to break it out to explain it. First, what the line does here is to bitwise AND the current tile number with 1. 
This will give us just whatever the last digit was before we bit shift it away. The AND operation will cancel out all the other digits in the current tile number, because anything ANDed with 0 is 0, and anything ANDed with 1 is itself. It assigns this value to an int32, which is a number that is fixed at 32 bits. This means it will be the same size as the variable where the tile number is stored. The code then gets the negative of this value. If the last digit was 0, then this will still be 0, but if it was 1, then the binary number becomes all 1s, as this is the binary way to represent negative 1 in a 32-bit signed integer. The first 1 indicates that this value is negative, and the rest of the digits, being all 1s, mean that this is the highest possible negative integer, therefore negative 1. For its third step, the formula then takes this sequence of either all zeros or all ones and bitwise adds it with our feedback number. Looking at the individual digits, you can see that the result of this is either going to be all zeros, because no digits are one in the value we're adding with, or if all digits are one, we'll just get the unaltered feedback number again. We'll call this value of either nothing or the feedback the feedback this step. The bit shift then gets performed. We've already saved the last digit, so it drops off the end, and a zero comes in on the left, and the XOR is done with the feedback this step against the bit shifted number like we saw in the demonstration. If the last digit of the tile number before the bit shift was zero, then the XOR will be against all zeros and nothing will happen. If it was one, then the XOR will be against the feedback number, and the required bits will toggle. This is the last step of our LFSR code, the tile variable becomes our new tile number, and we start the next loop by updating the new tile number we've chosen. By performing all these bitwise operations, we've recreated all the decisions of the approach we described earlier. If the last digit was 0, then our XOR ultimately does nothing, and if the last digit was 1, the XOR has the effect we intended. The code performs as many loops through this code as needed this tick, then it stores its current tile back in the cur tile loop tile variable, and waits until the next tick to pick up where it left off, eventually covering the whole map. The reason the code does all this mathematics in this seemingly roundabout way is because it involves no conditions at all. It can perform the same mathematics each time without checking what any numbers are, and bitwise operations are extremely fast even as numbers grow large. XOR in particular is so fast that in certain circumstances, to clear a piece of memory to zero, it's faster for a computer to XOR whatever data is in there to itself, instead of making the effort to remember what the number zero is and to write it explicitly. So while we could write the algorithm in code the way we imagine it when talking about it, it can be much faster to do it the way it's written here, especially for a calculation that's going to be called so often. No matter what the size of the open TTT map is, this technique allows it to use a random seeming sequence of tiles without storing anything in advance, and spending almost no effort on calculation, making it suitable for even the game's most gigantic maps. The way that linear feedback shift registers use only bitwise operations makes them easy to build in hardware as well as software, and they have uses in sound processing, cryptography, telecommunications and many other areas that require fast pseudo-random number generation. Crossing over with my channel's main subject, a function very similar to OpenTDD's tile refresh is used in Doom's predecessor Wolfenstein 3D to produce the effect of the screen gradually filling with random pixels when you die or complete an episode. I first heard of the LFSR technique by reading Fabian Sanglard's excellent article on this fizzle fade effect, and you can read more about it and other coding tricks on his site at fabiansanglard.net. Thank you to everyone on the left here for supporting me creating Stumbling Tours videos. If you'd like to join in or make suggestions for other games to cover, please have a look at David X. Newton on Patreon.